Oh, hey there, folks. Don't mind me. I'm just playing games on my, uh, my, my super cool Lost in Limited Game Boy Color that is actually original on a aftermarket reproduction. Oh, but this screen, it's so hard to see. I wish there was another way without modifying this console. Oh, but wait. There is. So I've got this, uh, sorry, I'll not do that again. <laughs> got this, uh, drop-in kit from, uh, the company I so affectionately refer to as One Chip here. Now, this is not the first time I've done a video on this, but unfortunately the first time was, uh, they provided a defective unit, so... We're gonna go ahead and start over here. So, start with the kit here. Comes with these three wires, two short, one long. And then we've got the um, screen assembly here, which has the LCD itself with the converter board already attached. Note that this board is effectively glued to the LCD. Um, LCD is already plugged in. The entire point of this kit is it's intended to be drop-in, so you don't have to modify your Game Boy, so we'll see about that. Um, aside from the LCD assembly, we get some film to stick on the back of here to try and insulate things. Not strictly necessary, but if the kit maker includes it, then it's probably a good idea. And then we've got the adhesive gasket for uh, sticking this thing into the um, into the console. And for tonight's donor, I have a authentic Game Boy Color uh, Lawson Limited Edition that we're going to be modifying with this backlight kit. Uh, so the appeal of a kit like this is that you don't have to modify the Game Boy you're putting it in. I mean, aside from, of course, you know, the literal process of disassembling the thing and replacing parts, it's reversible is what we're trying to add in here. Uh, so I am going to start with my working Game Boy and it, th this thing's basically a ship of Theseus. There don't, don't have any sympathy for it. Um, I bought this console very, very cheap before the, the boom the most recent boom, <laughs> uh, so probably like 2018, 2019-ish, and it was inexpensive for a Game Boy Color, full stop. Not not even for a limited edition, it was just, it was a parts unit. Like, the motherboard in this thing was so waterlogged, um, and yet still 100% perfectly functional, it was just literally flaking itself apart. Um, but it did work. <laughs> anyway, all of the insides have been replaced with um, OEM parts, but working OEM parts. Uh, oh, actually, I don't need to turn that, take that out yet, because first we want to get some baseline power usage measurements. So I'm going to use my Pokemon Silver here. And ooh, I thought that was plugged in. Hopefully it's right here. The plan was to refurbish this thing years ago and just have it as part of my collection, but that never happened. So now we're gonna modify it. Ho! Oh, panicked, I thought it wasn't working again. Got to switch the uh, power supply on, huh? All right, so in the overworld at 2.4 volts, the nice OEM screen there, where you can't see crap unless you hold it at just the right angle. I'll max out the volume just for consistency here. This one's actually shockingly loud. <laughs> did I recap this? I did not recap this, this is all original. All right, oh, cool. Um, 2.4 volts, this thing is pulling 
68 to 73 milliamps. Um, which is a little on the low side. Certainly nothing to be concerned about. It's just most Game Boys pull a little bit more power. Um, in this particular case, I have cleaned this thing within an inch of its life. So... That could be making up the difference. You know, stuff like uh, dirty power switch, dirty DC jack. That's not going to make a difference here. It's okay. Now that we have our baseline power usage, I can pop that bale up, pull that screen out. I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside for a moment because all we want right now is this part. He says he's cleaned this thing to within an inch of its life, but he also has a cotton swab on his desk ready to clean up the button inputs because he doesn't know if they've been cleaned and they certainly don't look it. But anyway, let's get some more power usage numbers and uh, check it out. I'm going to go ahead and flip this thing over so I can hold it, but uh, here goes nothing. This time I flipped the power supply on. <laughs> uh, and it just works. Or not, because it should have booted my game. I probably jiggled it by accident. No, oh, or not. It just doesn't want to boot my game now. That's cute. There it goes. Only took a few tries and nothing. Off to a great start. All right. I'm gonna assume it's my game for now and we'll continue with the video, but if I get any more weirdness, I'll have to investigate a little bit more further. Uh, at this default brightness, at 2.4 volts, this thing is pulling uh, 247 to 254 milliamps, which, gosh, what was it before, like 70? It's kind of a lot. It's like three times as much. Um, hmm. Let's see what other options we have. One of these should be brightness. Oh, I think it's hitting the uh, overcurrent protection on my power supply. So this thing is set to 2.4 volts, 0.75 milliamps, or well, 0.75 amps, so 750 milliamps, which means this thing is peaking at over 750 milliamps trying to boot up. I think that's what's going on here. Let's modify that. I'll bump that up. And that's not what's happening. Okay. Or maybe it is, but the <laughs> but the limits on the Game Boy side, not the power supply side. This thing does get quite warm. If I recall correctly, we can get into an OSD here, maybe? No. I don't know. I don't remember how it works. We'll play with this more. Um, the important thing is we know it works. I'll have to grab more power supply or power usage measurements later. Now that we know it works, we can continue with the install and once it's a little bit more stable, um, I'll be able to play around with it a little bit more. Let's go ahead and pop that 
it out. So normally I like the um, the funny playing style kits, uh, especially if you get one of their housings, you just kind of drop it in and everything just works. But I suppose this is a bad example because, well, <laughs> um, same color. But um, for everything else, let's say you do have a limited edition that isn't a loss in limited, um, you want to actually play it, which good for you. These things are meant to be played. Um, go for it. But for funny playing, you could also just get the same color. Anyway, um, we're going to be putting this screen in this console, which means the OEM screen needs to come out. Easiest way to do that on these old stock Game Boys, and forgive me, this one's going to come out a lot easier because I've had it apart before, but you just give the shell a little twist. You hear the, the popping as the adhesive releases. And then usually you can just stick a finger in there and pry it off. It comes off, it comes out relatively easy. It's not gonna fight you too bad. Um, in the particular case of this kit, you could also go ahead and remove the stock adhesive and replace it with the adhesive that they give you. This little cutout up here goes towards the top. You just kinda peel off this backing and then put that whole thing in there it's a lot easier to install when you don't have a stock lens. This kit does not come with a lens because you can use your stock lens. So on that note, we'll just go ahead and install this just like that. Um, I am trying to remember which way it goes. I don't think it matters too much though. I think, let me wipe this off while I have it apart. Hang on just a sec. There's a big spot like right in the middle of the screen. I wanted to make sure that's on the front, not the back. But I think we're good to go. So peel that up. I'm gonna align this with the top right here. And just uh, drop it in on the stock adhesive. It should work quite a bit better than the uh, one I did during the stream with this aftermarket housing. Don't get me wrong, I really like this housing. It's just the cutout sized a little bit differently for bigger kits, and so there's less meat for the kit to grab onto. Uh, I'm pretty sure that goes that way. Yeah, maybe. Looks like maybe I shouldn't have centered it on the corner because now the ribbon is not lined up. I probably... And because I'm using the stock adhesive, I can just twist the shell again to pop this out. If I was using the replacement adhesive, this is permanent adhesive. I am going to slide this over just a little bit so that it is lined up with the top left of the shell now instead of the top right. I believe that was my mistake. Or maybe it just needs to be centered and I'm overthinking. No, that looks a lot better, actually. Okay. So, with that in there... Ooh. Uh, I would like to do the wiring. Um, shoot. I should have thought about that first. One of the annoying things about this kit, now it's it's drop-in, so there's no need to do the wiring. In fact, I anticipate most people won't, but because the motherboard is kind of adhered to the screen, the only way to do the wiring is to solder up while it's already assembled, which runs the risk of damaging the LCD. Um, because, you know, the tip of this thing is like 300 degrees Celsius, and these LCDs, they don't handle that kind of heat very well. Uh, I'm also not sure why they give us such short wires. That's not really a problem here, but not exactly the easiest thing to manage. So I'm going to take this thing. I'm gonna pull these two wires off of it.
maybe. Come on, there we go. Two birds, one stone. I need to desolder those anyway. But I also wanted longer wires for this. So now I can come back in here. Gonna add this bad boy to B. Again, not necessary. This is only for button controls, not for power. Uh, and this thing does come with touch sensors, so you don't even need to use the button controls. I just want to do it to show off all the features. And I think the wires that it comes with are silly. So I'm using my own. Excellent. And now, usually the easiest way to do this is to use the test pads, but I don't like using the test pads, especially with transparent shells, because the test pads, um, well, one, they're located somewhat inconveniently, but two, it just looks bad using them. Give these contacts a quick once over. Because this board is not nearly as clean as I thought it was. But, eh, good enough. All right. Game Boy Color uses a common ground system for the buttons. So it's very easy to trace these out. I want to use select. One of these is a ground. So definitely that one. So this one is the pad that I want to solder to, P12. But because, like I said, it's in a bit of a silly spot. Um, I don't want to see a wire snaked across the front of this thing. So I am instead going to solder to the via, which should be one of these over here. So in this serial number box, there is a row of five vias. It is the one all the way over to the right. And then B and A are probably the ones right next to it. Yep. So B is the middle of this group of three. A is probably the right. Yep. And then start is probably the left. Yep. Easy. Get these tinned. It's usually a lot easier to just scrape the solder mask, but I've usually had success by just flooding the area with solder and then enough solder usually gets in there. But I can uh, work from there, but of course that is not happening today. All right, let's do this the proper way then. Flux from the area, and then we get How do I not have this thing handy? I use it all the time. Okay, well, oh, there it is. Harbor Glass Scratch Pin. Just 
to use that on the board over the vias. This is my crappy one. I had a lot of pressure and it barely works, but it do work. There's one. Let's get the next one. There's the next one. Let's get the third one. Come in. And I got the third one. Easy. See how much easier that is when we just do it the right way? All right. So the red one I did to select. one this is a just along the outside Did not have enough solder in any of these holes Usually capillary, cap capillary action soaks it in, but that didn't happen. And so just like that, we should have no more soldering to do. Um, and again, for like the fifth time, that's just button controls. We don't need that for most installs. Wrap that around there. Let me twist things around. You can hide all the wires behind that. You won't even see. Look at that. But first, let's go ahead and get these touch sensors installed. Personally, I think if you are getting the button controls hooked up, just go ahead and remove the touch sensors while you're at it. You'll probably have a much better time. I'm fairly certain every control can be accessed from within the kit itself via the button controls. You don't need a... Don't need the touch sensors, unlike Funny Playing's kits. do that. Let's see. Probably not. I don't know if there's enough slack on that. probably going to get in the way of the IR window, but I wanted it not in the way of the IR window, so I pasted it onto the shell. Hmm. Sorry for that weird cut. My phone just 
stopped recording out of the blue. Um, I got the uh, touch sensors installed, and then I went ahead and put the board in, and I looked up and my phone wasn't recording. Thankfully, I've only missed about two minutes, and I don't have to undo all of this and pretend to be doing this video again from scratch. Um, got the touch sensors in. I got the board installed. Next. Oh, wow. I am just now noticing how weird the text on that CPU is. That's so bizarre. I'm sorry. I am totally, totally distracted now because Game Boy Color CPUs, the font on that is usually different. That's weird. I mean, it's not a counterfeit, I don't think never seen one anyway totally distracted bend that over and get that inserted if you know what i mean so that we uh get our video signal all right the touch sensor was definitely in the way but i was able to move it out of the way enough Back to screws. When reinstalling these screws, it is extremely important you twist it backwards while applying just a little bit of pressure, slowly, until it clicks and kind of drops into place, and then you can start spinning the other way and install the screw. The reason for this is these are self-tapping screws. If you're doing this install in a brand new shell, you will notice that none of the screw posts are tapped because they give you self tappers so that you tap it yourself. It is not currently feasible to mold threads into a plastic injection molded housing. Um, the powers that be have decided that it's a lot easier, a lot more efficient. It just works better for everyone. If you don't put any threads whatsoever in the plastic and you just make your own threads with the screws, it works. It's fine. The caveat is the threads themselves are a little bit weaker, which means when you re-thread a screw, you have to make sure it's going into the threads you already cut and it's not cutting new threads. Don't forget your power switch or your IR window. Pop that back in. So again, thread this bad boy in, we back it up until it clicks, kind of drops into place, and then I can uh, spin it in. I'm not going to tighten it down all the way, not at least until I have three of these bad boys in. Usually it's a lot more quiet than that. It usually doesn't give me that loud of a click. All right. And now I'm just gonna bottom these out and then back them up a quarter turn. We do not want these over tightened, especially in a shell that I cannot ever replace because Nintendo stopped making them 20 years ago. And it's probably already a little bit brittle, what with its uh, exposure to the elements and the fact that it's not exactly clear anymore, it's a little bit clear and yellow, but that's okay. The idea was we could create a sleeper Game Boy Color, or a Game Boy Color that is not visibly, outwardly, outwardly modified. Or, at the very least, you know, we'll just ignore the fact that the screen is black instead of, um, you know, the, the lightish gray that it usually is when those consoles are off. But that's okay. We don't, we, we don't worry about that. Don't worry about that little guy. Huh? Huh? It's still not booting games, right? It's also still that Pokemon Silver, so maybe, maybe it's fine. 
Maybe it's just the game. Because in game, it's working totally fine. I apologize, you probably can't see squat because this screen does not get very bright. But that's okay. So in game, everything seems to be working quite all right. I don't have a thing registered. Let's do artificial tests. Uh-oh, that's not looking good. Oh, there it goes. Get the 240p test suite. Okay, so the right touch sensor cycles through brightness. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15 levels? Yes. The right or left touch sensor doesn't seem to do anything on short press or medium press or, well, okay. Long press seems to cycle through those color palettes, uh, which if I recall correctly, we can disable entirely. Come on, one more. Nope, now one more. Nope, now one more, I swear. There can't be that many, there we go. All right, and the right touch sensor, I never did a medium press. Medium press doesn't seem to do anything. How about a long press? Long press cycles between the pixel grid emulation modes. So by default, we had horizontal and vertical lines. Now we have no lines. Now we have horizontal only lines. Now we have both lines again. Do we not have vertical only lines? Interesting. Oh, there we go. There's vertical only lines. It's right after horizontal. I missed it somehow, and then there's both again. And then I think that's it. And then if you press both at the same time, just a quick press. Nope, how about a medium press? Nope, long press. Yeah, there we go. There should be an OSD for this. So long press of both touch sensors brings us into the OSD. The right touch sensor increments, I'm gonna set that to 15. And then the left touch sensor moves us through the different options. I'm gonna leave it on that. And uh, no, I'll, I'll leave it on no pixel grid because I think that looks the best. And then I'm gonna cycle back and drop the brightness so you can actually see it again. Uh, that's fine. start over again so yeah brightness color mode that's the the palettes that I personally don't care about and I don't really see any use case for any of them aside from maybe black and white uh, but that's it pixel effects are the pixel grid modes next we have FRM which I will uh, we'll talk more on that later Quick touch, I'm going to turn that to off because I'm pretty sure that allows us to set the um, color palettes with the left touch sensor. H position allows us to move the display image between the left and right. Uh, I guess we got to use the touch sensor for that. That's unfortunate because I overshot it. <laughs> Can I hold that for quicker? No. That's kind of tedious, but in their defense, that is, this is a one and done type thing. Uh, yeah, that looks 
good. The position definitely needs to come down. And last option is factory reset. Uh, hopefully we don't need any of the factory reset options. I remember on some of the other kits, the uh, color palette color values would get corrupt somehow and the screen would just go totally black if you uh, accidentally hit one of the touch sensors while you were switching the thing off. Um, I don't think this kit works fundamentally similarly enough for that to even be an issue, but it's nice to have, I guess, just in case. Otherwise, that's about it. Um, it's intended to be drop-in, you know, kind of set and forget, that sort of thing. I'm into it. I like it. It's good. Uh, since we have button controls hooked up, select and A lowers the brightness, select and B raises the brightness. Um, if we hold select A, B, that brings us into the OSD, where select brings us through the options, and then A and B let us increment and decrement. Um, I had mine hooked up A to A and B to B, probably do B to A and A to B so that the up is, or the down is on B and the up is on A, but I don't know, that's just me. And then select A, B, closes it again, and I don't think there are any other options. Or any, like, uh, shortcuts, that's it. Uh... Nicely enough, they appear to have fixed the brightness settings. Um, on the old kit, it was very, very easy to... Oh, yeah. The brightness modes were in the wrong order or something like that, where um, 14 is brighter than option 15. Yeah, I, I don't know what was going on there. And then if we close that, and I think keep hitting the brightness button. Nope. There we go. We could get the brightness to bug out and just switch off entirely, which is super cool. And you just kind of got to sit there hitting the button until it works. I don't know. I'm going to have to review my video to, to figure out how to undo that. <laughs> but thankfully, they have fixed that. It no longer does that which is convenient. It is now no longer possible to brick your brightness settings just by using the built-in shortcuts. Excellent job. Thank you for fixing that. That is, that's, that's wonderful. Now, if only they could do something about this power usage, which let's double check that because I did a real piss poor job of checking that earlier. And unfortunately, I am going to have to just kind of hold this on because I assembled this thing. I forgot I still needed to do this. But uh, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. And hopefully I won't do that again. <laughs> okay. In the overworld, same card, volume maxed, brightness maxed, the console shuts off. We'll verify that on batteries. It might just be power supply weirdness. Verify that on batteries very easily, very quickly. Okay, yeah, that's what I was afraid of. I think there's just a little bit too much voltage sag, so I think I need to bump this up. Uh, 
we're going to do 3 volts instead of 2.4. And I'm setting that back to quarter of an amp. Just in case. And now I bet it should bolt boot at full brightness. Yep, that's what I thought. Okay, so it is at brightness 15 at three volts, not 2.4. So I'm gonna do some math on that in the spreadsheet, I think. Uh, but at three volts, max brightness, this console is pulling 255 to 257 milliamps. Um, oop, I saw a peak of 260 milliamps, which I, it's hard to compare milliamps, and I've always done milliamps, uh, even though I should be doing watts. Um, this is three quarters of a watt, 0.75 watts. That's a lot. By default, like out of the box, th these consoles are a quarter of a watt. Now we're at three quarters of a watt. That's a lot of, that's, that's a big increase. Uh, let's set this to low brightness now and measure the bottom end. At three volts, um, low brightness, this thing is pulling 149 to 151 milliamps. Eh, not great, but not, not terrible. For comparison, let's check out the previous iteration of the kit. I am told that the well, I was told that they fixed that power um, brightness bug. Oh shoot, which I need to fix first or we won't get any measurements out of this thing. I don't remember if it's B or A that I have to do, but I'm guessing, there we go. Never mind. All right, so brightness 27 obviously doesn't work because this thing doesn't have 27 modes. <laughs> We're gonna check brightness level 14 because that is the max brightness that this specific kit supports. The current version supports 15. But this one only does 14. But just to see what they've done as far as power goes. So at three volts, the older version of this kit is actually pulling less power. Uh, 203 to 213 or 218 milliamps. But this kit does not support as much brightness. This is a lower effective brightness level. Uh, oh. Nope. I lost brightness again. I just wanted... set it down to the minimum brightness. At the minimum brightness level, three volts, this console pulls 140, excuse me, 136 to 141 milliamps. Oop, 136 to 145. So this thing is pulling about 420-ish watts, um, point, uh, milliwatts, sorry. Um, I forgot to carry the decimal. Anyway. The older one's a little bit lower. Interesting. But I'll take slightly more power usage for um, if the trade-off is having working, stable brightness controls that I can actually use. Granted, I normally just kind of set it and forget it, leave it on the one brightness level. But the fact that it's a key combo makes me feel like someday I'm just gonna adjust it without even thinking and then, you know, give, give myself that black screen and then I won't be able to do anything about it. I, I don't know. It seems fine. The power usage is certainly high, but it's also working. Oops. 
EZ Flash Jr. is my most power intensive cart. Nickel metal hydride batteries are of course the weakest batteries for power intensive uh, applications. And I have the console set to the maximum brightness. As you can see, this does not work. This is not, <laughs> this is not a winning combination. A lithium ion battery mod would solve this problem. Oh no. <laughs> oh, there it goes. I had it inserted too far. I had to dangle it out a little. As you can see, the higher voltage from the external power supply isn't giving this thing any problems. Um, so it's really just a matter of our power supply. Unfortunately, the, the, the demand, the load on the system is so great that the voltage drops a little bit too low and brings it down into the danger zone where it starts soft resetting like that. There's nothing we can do about that. So all I can say is if you want to use one of these kits with these types of batteries, like you're, you're kind of kind of SOL. It is my understanding that the appeal of these drop-in kits where you can just put it in the Game Boy without having to do any soldering, without having to do any modifying, cutting up the shell, replacing the shell, you know, anything like that is that it's reversible, you know, it's easy, it's just drop-in, you don't have to do any other mods. However, the super high power usage of this kit makes it kind of unusable unless you're okay with just oop, with um, just setting the brightness down and you know maybe not using it at max which is fine I it gets bright enough I think it's fine internal power brightness is a little bit lower but I'm booting off my nickel metal hydride batteries it's working it's loading slow I don't know what's up with that but it is working. And that's why I test the way I test, because if this scenario works, then it should probably work for you too. This is what I consider worst case scenario. But it do be working, so there's that. All right, so here is one of the usual tests that I do with this sort of thing. Um, I'm sure if you've seen any of my other videos, you've heard this spiel a million times before. There we go, focus. Um, the original Game Boy console had no method of achieving transparency. Now oh, there we go. It does focus. Uh, so what devs did to work around that and get transparency uh, is they would flicker a sprite on and off as quickly as possible, or about 60 times a second, 59.7. Um, in this particular case, there is also a sprite limit. The console can only display so many sprites before it runs out of memory. There's just only so much memory to address sprites. All of these little moving things on the screen, these are sprites. In fact, because of how the tiling works, technically, I believe... Link is four sprites. This dog over here, I believe, is also four sprites. This chain chomp, I believe, is also four sprites. And then each one of those links is a single sprite, and then each one of these butterflies is a single sprite. Don't quote me on this. Fairly certain that's how that works. If that's the case, and the limit is 32, we have 4, 8, 12, uh, 17, 18, 19 sprites on screen right now, and that's just the three characters and the two butterflies. We're already halfway over our limit. And so Nintendo's, so, or the, the dev's solution to that in this case was to flicker, alternate every other chain. Now, this whole spiel has a purpose. I have FRM off. As you can see, oh, come on. How do I close that? There we go. As you can see, the flickering is actually pretty minimal. Uh, what the FRM feature does is it takes two consecutive frames that the Game Boy is outputting, it kind of averages them together so that any flickering just results in transparency. However, the 
natural pixel response time of the LCD that they use in this particular kit is kind of lackluster compared to some of the LCDs used in other kits, like the Q5 LCD, for example. That's not a bad thing. Um, it just means they don't have to do nearly as much heavy lifting to get that um, transparency effect to display properly. This is a bad example. A much better example is the game Zass, which is also insanely expensive and why I use a flash card. I don't own one yet. I can't justify spending that much on a test card. This game is the best example as far as um, the transparency effect because the entire background of this game is intended to be transparent, which means most kits just show a flickery mess. And indeed, that's exactly what I'm seeing right here. Hopefully the camera is picking up on that. I'm gonna shake it around a little just in case the um, iPhone's doing, doing me some favors. I think the shaking helps with that, but there you go. To combat this, however, we can select AB, go down to FRM, switch that on, and then close the menu, and what do you know? Flicker be gone. Oh, I kind of set myself up for that one, huh? Um, it just works. It's actually genuinely a wonderful feature. Granted, most games do not rely on this effect, especially to the severity that this particular game does. And if you're the type that, you know, Game Boys are just Pokemon machines to you and you don't play anything else on them, then this is not a feature you'd even notice, let alone appreciate. But if you're the type that does play games with a little bit of transparency here and there, like Zass, then um, this is a wonderful feature to have. And it does seem to work really, really well. Um, you don't necessarily want to leave it on when you don't need it, um, because by nature of what it's doing, it does introduce a little bit more lag um, on paper. I haven't actually measured it, and even if I do, uh, it's likely going to be only an additional frame. Um, but normally, how these kits work is they display the frame data as they receive it. So as the Game Boy is sending the frame, the screen kit is drawing said frame. With FRM enabled, however, it waits until it has the complete frame and then the frame after it so that it can math the two together and then display the one amalgamated frame instead. Um, I personally haven't noticed any lag. I am personally not very sensitive to input lag at all anyway. I'm the type to play video games through my capture card on the OBS preview window and um, not notice a single problem. Um, Granted, I'm not saying I'm immune to input lag. I just, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me to the extent that it bothers some people. And if you're one of those people, you know who you are. Um, I'm sorry. Hopefully this feature doesn't uh, mess you up too much or um, hopefully it's not that bad. Uh, one day I hope to get some lag testing done, but that day is not today. So that being said, let's um, summarize, I guess. And, uh, yeah, you know what? A lot of my problems that I discussed on the initial stream that I did with this Game Boy, you know, a lot of that's still here. Thankfully, they fixed the uh, brightness setting bug. Um, I can't seem to trigger it, at least not in the same way. I'm, I, I, I'm sure there's some esoteric sequence of buttons and inputs that I could do to trigger some other sort of bug, but... Not necessarily something that would occur under normal circumstances, so I'm really not too worried about it. Um, and, you know, even still, that brightness bug was uh, game-breaking, but the bug was undone the same way it was done. That is, if you could trigger it, you could also turn it off. Um, so you could only trigger it by having button inputs, but by having button inputs, you could also just undo it so 
I guess it wasn't that big of a deal, but regardless, very glad they fixed it. Much improved. However, the power usage of this thing is still a little bit too high for me to be comfortable recommending it for drop-in purposes. Yes, it does work. It does do exactly what it says. The power usage isn't terrible. Um, if I recall correctly, it was at like three quarters of a watt, whereas the Game Boy is normally about a quarter of a watt. So let's put this into practical examples. If you get 20 hours of game time out of a pair of double A's and whatever game, it doesn't matter, 20 hours, give or take. I have no idea what a Game Boy Color gets. I'm assuming it's closer to 30 hours on a pair of uh, Lottas or something. Um, stock, of course, no backlight screen. Um, but you install one of these bad boy screens, you've tripled the power usage. You've multiplied the footprint by three. So if you were getting 20 hours, you're now going to get closer to, uh, what, seven hours, six and a half, give or take. It's not linear because the higher the power usage, generally the lower the efficiency. Um, so round down usually works. Uh, as well, you don't use 100% of the power in most batteries, especially because of low voltage cutoffs. Um, yeah, that being said, as long as you are not planning on using this either with a Easy Flash Junior, let's double check the EverDrive while we're at it. Um, I don't know if we'll run into the same problem, but it'd be nice to know, wouldn't it? Um, as long as you're not planning on using this with an SD-based flash cart, or if you are planning on using it with a battery mod, such as a lithium ion battery, you know, you know, you know the deal, you know what those look like. Um, if you're using it with one of those, it's probably fine. But on that note, if you're using it with a battery mod, your console's also likely already modded and you could be served by just using a different kit. Um, I don't, I don't know that this is necessarily the kit. Like, I don't know. The, the, the prerequisites don't make sense for the intended audience. Does that make sense? Whatever. Doesn't matter. Yeah, max brightness on an EverDrive doesn't seem to be too much of a fun experience either. But... I bet we just plug this thing in again, and I bet it just works. Yep. That's a shame. It's such a silly problem to have, and I don't know that there's an easy fix for that, because the, these screens are not compatible. Like, you can't just plug a screen into any old thing. These are... These consoles are designed explicitly for the screens that they came with, and anything else needs an adapter, and those adapters require power. So, yeah, they just need to figure out a way to use an adapter that has a lower footprint, I guess. Um, until then, though, I guess, you know, if if this is your intended use case, you know, you want to install it in your, your fantastic limited edition Game Boy, yeah, sure, it works. Um, if you're not, like, gung-ho on this, though, I, wait for something else, I think. Um, Cloud Game Store usually does some pretty good stuff in the drop-in area. Uh, I believe they already have a Game Boy Color kit that should be drop-in. Um, I have most recently done the laminated versions of that, which are most certainly not drop-in. But, um, got the thing right here, just boot it up and show it off. They look good. They're good too. Uh, their, their 2.45, I think is a little bit better of a match. It's slightly less feature complete than this one chip kit, uh, in that as long as you don't care for the FRM feature or having an OSD, the Cloud Game Store kit is a fantastic way to go. And on that note, I mentioned this screen, the pixel response is, is uh, it's kind of meh, so you don't need to make use of FRM nearly as much. The Cloud Game Store kits are 
they're a little bit worse in that regard, or I guess a little bit better in that regard, um, in that they don't need FRM so much because the pixel response is, at, is it's a lot lower on those screens, which in this, in this case is a good thing, so I, I don't know. If you're okay with doing a little bit of a modification, like for example, replacing the shell of the console, you know, you, you like your console, but you're not married to the shell. In this case, I think it's a little bit silly because this is a limited edition, you know, keep the shell. It's not that bad, but you can also go with the funny playing equivalent and yeah, now that I have them side by side, I, I can see that those are two very distinct colors. But, you know, it's it's close enough. Like, you could still have fun. And then you could still keep this one on your shelf, you know what I mean? You play this one, you beat it to shit. This is the pretty one that you look at. I don't know. I guess when you're getting into stuff like that, it stops making so much sense. And, you know, you just, you just do whatever whatever your heart feels is necessary. And, and if you're happy, then that's all that matters. But anyway, you know who you are. I hope this helped. Um, I'm rambling. I need to cut this off here. This is just ridiculous at this point. So um, thanks to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending me this kit to check out and this one to check out. <laughs> um, sorry for doing the, the double videos on basically the same topic, but... The one they sent was defective, and thankfully they have fixed it since, so um, I'm actually pretty pleased with that. Power usage is still a little bit high, but it is what it is. Anyway, I will go ahead and link to this stuff down in the description. I'll link to the stream where I did this one if you guys want to check that out. I'll also link to a video on the Funny Playing Q5 Game Boy Color stuff, uh, because I think that is also like an honorable mention if you're considering dropping stuff. As long as you buy the Funny Playing Shell 2, the Funny Playing Kits are also dropping. I, I, I realize how that sounds, but I also keep up with the subreddit and the community discords and whatnot. And I have seen more people... I, I have not seen anyone not reshell their Game Boy while doing a backlight mod unless it's a limited edition... Um, I guess this is a better example of limited editions, but you, you know what I mean. You know what I'm getting at. You don't you don't need me to parade a bunch of Game Boys out in front of you. You know who you are. It's not a bad kit, but there are better kits. Thanks again. Catch you all next time.